was ordained to the priesthood and was tonsured a monk, receiving the name Callistos. In the same year, he became a lecturer at Oxford teaching Eastern Orthodox studies, the position which he held for 35 years until his retirement. In 1982, he was consecrated to the Episcopate as an auxiliary bishop with the title <coughs> Bishop of, of Dioclea, an assistant to the Bishop of the Ecumenical Patriarchate's Orthodox Archdiocese of Theatria and Great Britain. Despite his elevation, Bishop Callistos remained at Oxford and carried on his duties both as the parish priest of the Oxford Greek Orthodox community and as a lecturer at the university. <coughs> Metropolitan Callistos is perhaps best known as the author of the book, The Orthodox Church, published when he was a layman in 1963 and subsequently revised several times. Since his retirement in 2001, Metropolitan Callistos has continued to publish and give lectures on Orthodox Christianity, traveling widely. He's also remained active in the ecumenical movement, serving as Orthodox co-chairman of the International Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue, and as a member of the international dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, representing the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And on March 31st, 2007, in recognition of his many years of service to the Church, he was elevated to the rank of Metropolitan. This evening he will be speaking to us on the topic, Papal Primacy, Still an Insuperable Obstacle? Question mark. Please welcome Metropolitan Callistos. Before I attempt to answer the question in my title, let me recall memories of five different popes. Some of them I've only viewed from a distance, others I've encountered personally face to face. The first pope I remember is Pius XII, whom I only viewed from a distance 60 years ago, in 1955. I attended a general audience in the courtyard of the papal summer residence at Castel Gandolfo. The Pope appeared on a balcony, high and lifted up, and as he began to confer his apostolic blessing, the heavens opened. In the pouring rain, others held up for papal benediction their rosaries and their statues of the Sacred Heart. I held up my opened umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> to my regret, I never saw John the Twenty-Third, either face to face or at a distance. But I note in his case the supreme importance of human freedom, of acts of voluntary choice taken by human persons in their conscience before God. As far as I recall, at the time of his accession, nobody in the Catholic Church or outside expected a further ecumenical council. Many people felt that this was unnecessary since the proclamation of infallibility at Vatican I in 1870. 
1950, the dogma of the Assumption was proclaimed not by a council, but by the Pope alone. Though, of course, he only did so after worldwide consultation. Less than three months, I think, after his accession, on the 25th of January 1959, John XXIII, out of the blue, announced his intention to summon an ecumenical council. I don't know whether we have any evidence of precisely what influenced him to make that decision, but it was his personal decision. And it was this personal decision that he took on his conscience before God that has transformed the Catholic Church in the last half century. I note that events happened with surprising speed. Uh, the announcement was made in January 59 and less than uh, four years later, the 1st of October 1962, the Council actually met. It's interesting to contrast the orthodox time scale. In 1903, <laughs> Patriarch Joachim III put out a famous encyclical, and here he stressed the need for meetings between the bishops of the different Orthodox churches. And here we have the seed of the later decision to hold a Holy and Great Council. Yet, 112 years later, this Holy and Great Council has not actually met. <laughs> There's a firm expectation that it will do so next year, 2016. I shall believe that when it happens. <laughs> Father George Florovsky used to say, the highest and most promising ecumenical virtue is patience. Well, that certainly applies to orthodox decisions. But I would add, an impatient patience is what we need. Next Pope whom I saw, though again only from a distance, was Paul VI. I see him as one of the greatest of the modern Popes, too much neglected. On, in June 1973, I was present at Mass in St. Peter's to mark the 10th anniversary of his accession. I was able to attend without a ticket. Surprisingly, St. Peter's was not at full. And my chief memory of that occasion is Pope Paul's sadness. He was not at all triumphalist or exuberant. He spoke in a subdued, even a sorrowful spirit. <coughs> John Paul I, as with John XXIII, I did not see either from a distance or face to face. But I met John Paul II several times face to face, particularly when I went as a delegate from the Ecumenical Patriarchate on the feast of St. Peter and St. Paul. The protocol on those occasions is that on the eve of the feast, there is a private meeting between the two or three Orthodox delegates with the Pope. And then on the feast day itself, we attend High Mass and then have lunch with the Pope. On my first visit, I remember Pope John Paul's puzzlement. You, he said, an Englishman? An Orthodox bishop? How is that possible? On the later visit, 20 years later, when I saw him, 
and I don't think he remembered our previous meeting, he said exactly the same words. <laughs> I felt like saying, you, a Pope, a Pope. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept that thought to myself. <laughs> At the private audience on our first visit, the Pope's schedule was running behind time. He was receiving the credentials of an ambassador from one of the more dicey South American states. And quite clearly, he did not wish to make this a purely formal occasion. He was grilling the man sharply on the human rights record of his state. And when eventually the doors opened from the Pope's private study and the ambassador emerged in all his glory, in his morning dress with all his medals, he was literally mopping his brow. <laughs> the Pope had clearly given him a hard time of it. And when we went in, Pope John Paul said to us, don't let's read our speeches now. We can read them tomorrow in the Osservatore Romano. Let's just have a talk together. John Paul II was a populist who could command the enthusiasm of vast crowds, grandiose in spirit. The building outside that window makes me think of his spirit a little in its grandiose style of architecture. But he was also a simple and straightforward person with warmth and humor. Benedict XVI, lunch with John Paul II after the High Mass, there were many guests and the Pope presided with eclat and distinction, but lunch with Benedict XVI was just for the three of us, Metropolitan John Zizioulas, myself, and the Pope, three old university professors, and we discussed academic life. But I remember that the meal ended with a superb glass of limoncello that was specially supplied to the Pope from a village in North Italy. With Pope Francis, I've only so far had one meeting on the 24th of October, 2014, with the members of the Orientale Lumen pilgrimage. I recall that in his address, Francis twice asked us, with some emphasis, to pray for him. And he also insisted upon the need for interior renewal. Indeed, without such interior renewal, there can surely be no progress in ecumenical dialogue. The quest for unity and the quest for holiness are essentially connected. This was a theme much emphasized by the Archbishop of Canterbury Michael Ramsey. Let me use an illustration. It's my own illustration, not that of Pope Francis. The sixth century writer from Palestine, Abba Dorotheos, uses this image. Imagine, he says, a circle marked out on the sand. And the center of the circle is God. From the circumference leading to the center, there are a series of lines. And these lines are the path which different human beings follow. Such, he says, is the nature of the Christian life. The closer we come to God, the closer we come to one another. And the further we are from the center, from God, 
the further we are from one another. In this way, we cannot have unity among each other unless we are all of us more closely united to the center of the circle, to God. Reflecting on unity, let us keep in mind the perceptive words of a great ecumenical pioneer, the Russian theologian, archpriest Sergius Bulgakov, who died in 1944. He used to say, unity is something that we already possess and that we are still seeking. Unity is both a gift and a task, both a present possession and a future hope. We need to hold in balance the already and the not yet. In the case of Orthodoxy and Rome, there is evidently an impressively large amount that we already possess in common. Faith in the Holy Trinity, in the cross and resurrection of God incarnate, through whose sacrifice the world is redeemed, in the communion of saints whose prayers support us. We have a shared devotion to the Holy Mother of God. May her protecting veil draw us to greater unity. We have a common faith in the mystical supper as the true body and blood of Christ. We share likewise a common expectation waiting for the second coming of the Savior. Whether Orthodox or Catholics, together we recall Christ's words, surely I am coming soon. And together we respond, amen, come Lord Jesus. In our work for unity, let us never forget the parousia. Let us always be eschatological ecumenists. But in other matters, Catholics and Orthodox are still seeking unity, especially in four major areas. There is first the procession of the Holy Spirit. And this has two aspects. On the one side, the addition to the creed of the filioque in the Latin West. This was inserted without ecumenical consent. And so we Orthodox still say to Rome, leave it out. As St. Mark of Ephesus said at the Council of Florence, this sacred deposit, this holy creed, we ask back from you. Restore it to us as you received it. But of course, you Eastern or uh, Catholics don't use the filioque. But then beyond that, we have the doctrine of the double procession, not just the addition to the creed, but the theology behind it. Here I can see a possible path of reconciliation. And here, this path is outlined for us by St. Augustine of Hippo in his work De Trinitate. He distinguishes there two kinds of procession. The Holy Spirit proceeds principaliter de patre, principally from the Father. And he proceeds from the Son only per donum patris through the gift of the Father. 
In other words, the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son in the same way as from the Father. The Father is the sole archeo principio, the only source of hypostatic being within the Trinity. And this position of St. Augustine was reaffirmed notably at the Council of Ferrara, Florence in 1438-39. Now, St. Gregory of Nyssa says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Is this not very close to what Augustine and the Council of Florence are saying? Orthodox and Catholics agree that the Holy Spirit is a person, not just, as I once heard him described, a sacred blast. And as a person, he is equal to the Father and Son, co-eternal with them. So, in East and in West, is our faith in the third member of the Trinity, in fact, so very different? I don't think it is. So on this issue, I am a dove, not a hawk. <laughs> Speaking of birds, as we know, the symbol of uh, an Orthodox bishop is a double-headed eagle. But I'm afraid very many Orthodox bishops behave as if their symbol was a double-headed ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> I once said that to a group of Orthodox bishops. They did not laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so we may turn to the second possible difference, purgatory. Now, we Orthodox don't use that word. But in common with Catholics, we pray for the departed, and we are confident that these prayers are of benefit to them. Do we differ so greatly, then, on this point? Much depends on the manner in which purgatory is envisaged. Do we think of purgatory as a prison or a hospital? as a place of punishment or a place of healing. If we think of purgatory not in penal but in therapeutic terms, and that is the way, for example, that St. Catherine of Genova thinks of it, and the way that Cardinal Newman thinks of purgatory in the dream of Gerontius, then, as an Orthodox, I don't feel there is a great difference between us. My third point is the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. As I see it, what is at issue here is the understanding of original sin. We Orthodox, on the whole, do not accept the Augustinian idea of inherited guilt. So the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is for us Orthodox not so much false as unnecessary. St. John Maximovich of Shanghai and San Francisco says that it is a bad answer to a non-existent question. <laughs> For orthodoxy, there are no dogmas concerning the fall and original sin. There are only theologumina. Both orthodox and Catholics agree that the Holy Virgin is Panagia, all holy, akrantos, without blemish, hyperevlogimeni, most highly blessed. Is that not enough? Is there not a danger of trying to say too much? 
I recall experience of a friend of mine at an interfaith conference in California. First, the Jewish rabbi got up and he told a few jokes and he sat down. Then the Zen Buddhist Roshi got up and he uttered a few riddling koans and he sat down. Then, said my friend, the Christians started talking and they talked and they talked and they said, we agree here, we don't agree here. They went on and on. And I thought to myself, said my friend, how clever they are. How do they know so much about God? And then I thought, if they know so much about God, why can't they just keep quiet? <laughs> what remains? Among my four points, I don't, and Father Chaff will be pleased to hear this, include Palamism, because I don't think that there is a fundamental difference between Orthodox and Catholics over the theology of St. Gregory Palamas, whose office is included, yes, in the Greek service books used by Eastern Catholics. But we do have the question of the papal claims, primacy and infallibility. To me, the more serious is the first, primacy. Because as it is often interpreted, infallibility appears almost to be a tautology. It's almost as if we said, the Pope speaks the truth when he speaks the truth. Now, the points at issue for me as an Orthodox, and here I ask them as questions. First, as regards primacy, does the Pope have supreme, direct, ordinary jurisdiction in the Christian East? If so, when did he exercise such jurisdiction in the first millennium? And was his exercise of such jurisdiction accepted by Eastern Christendom? I was interested that on a recent occasion I heard Cardinal Koch saying that we don't claim uh, as Catholics direct jurisdiction in the Christian East. Though how he could reconcile that with Vatican I, I'm not quite clear. Then secondly, as regards infallibility, does the Pope possess a charisma not given to other bishops whereby he discerns the truth. Gifts of grace are conferred through the sacraments. The Pope has no sacramental ordination different from that of the other bishops. Can we predict in advance that provided certain external conditions are fulfilled, the Pope must inevitably speak the truth. That is a claim that Orthodox are unable to accept, but I am not sure whether the Catholic doctrine actually affirms that. But let me attempt a positive approach to papal primacy from an orthodox standpoint. I have a little book at home called Nanny Says, and this includes sayings by old-fashioned nannies to their childish dependents. And one of the things that Nanny says is, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. That's another one that I recall from that book, um, which comes to my mind as I consider how much time I'm taking up. 
how time flies, as the monkey said, throwing the alarm clock out of the window. <laughs> My spiritual father, a Russian priest, Father George, and he would have assumed the congregation would have been standing. He said, when you're preaching and they start shuffling their feet, take no notice, just go on. <laughs> when they start looking at their watches, take no notice, just go on. But when they shake their watches to see whether they've stopped, you'd better <laughs> stop too. <laughs> So here is a positive statement, which I used at the Laureate Ali Lumen conference some years ago. A statement made by a French Orthodox, Father Lev Gillet, who wrote under the nom de plume of the monk of the Eastern Church. And this is in a letter to Dom Olivier Rousseau, monk of Cheftoin, editor of the journal Iranicon in the year 1947. Referring to the place of Rome in the communion of the churches, Father Lev says, this primacy of humility, service, and love. Humility, service, and love. Does not that apply very well to Pope Francis? And then he says, expressing the orthodox view, we do not envisage simply a primacy of honor or a nebulous sort of leadership, but a unique pastoral mission. Again, I underline those words, unique, pastoral mission. And Father Lev continues that three elements are to be combined together in the life of the church. The first is freedom in the Holy Spirit. The voice of the paraclete speaking in the conscience of every baptized member of the people of God what in Roman Catholicism is termed the sensus fidelium, and what Orthodox writers describe as the general conscience of the church. Secondly, there is holy tradition expressed above all in a conciliar form for Orthodox, especially in the seven ecumenical councils, but they do not exhaust holy tradition. There are many later councils which are part of holy tradition for us. The 14th century councils on Thalamism and divine light, that's part of tradition. The 17th century councils on the nature of the Eucharist and prayer for the departed. And there are many things not defined by any council which are yet held firmly with unruffled unanimity in the tradition of the church. And then thirdly, Father Lev mentions the charisma of Peter, the unique position of the Bishop of Rome as successor par excellence of Peter. And that is something which we Orthodox accept. Though from another point of view, all the bishops are successors of Peter. That's the position expounded by St. Cyprian in his work De Unitate. There are two papal titles that appeal to Orthodox, says Father Lev. The first is solicitudo omnium ecclesiarum, the care of all the churches. That is a phrase that St. Paul applied to his ministry, 2 Corinthians 11.28, and it is a title that various popes have applied 
to the papal office. Pope Syricius at the end of the fourth century, Pope Innocent I at the beginning of the fifth and other fifth century bishops. Care of all the churches, a universal ministry. And then the second title that appeals certainly to Orthodox is Servus Servorum Dei, the servant of the servants of God title used by Pope Gregory the Great, for example, at the end of the 6th century. Now what we note about these two titles is that they are pastoral rather than juridical. They speak of service, of diaconia, rather than of superior power. If the Roman primacy is spelled out in this way, as by Father Lear, rather than in the language of Vatican I, then the papal claims need not be an insuperable obstacle. But is Father Lev's formulation sufficient? A unique pastoral mission. Would that satisfy the Catholic press? Let me in the concluding part of my talk speak of recent disappointments or what might appear to be such. In the year 2007 Orthodox and Catholics met in the Byzantine city of Ravenna in North Italy. One thing I remember about that meeting was there were police everywhere, in the hotel foyer, lining the streets between the foyer and the place where we actually met, waiting outside the hall of our assemblage. And I asked myself, why are all these policemen here? Is it to protect the Orthodox delegates from their Catholic colleagues? <laughs> or is it to protect the Orthodox from the citizens of Ravenna? Or is it to protect the citizens of Ravenna from the Orthodox? <laughs> anyway, the Ravenna statement opened a door of hope. It stated the fact of the primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West. Ravenna distinguished three levels of authority, that of the bishop in his local diocese, then he said, then the Ravenna document said there is regional primacy, which means today the primacy of, for us Orthodox, the heads of the different autocephalous churches and patriarchs. But Ravenna distinguished a third level of primacy, that of the Pope, who, who they regarded not just as the senior patriarch, as many Orthodox do, but they considered that he has a universal ministry. That I consider a very important advance, because in the past many Orthodox have denied that the Pope is anything more than the senior patriarch. But Ravenna did not specify what the manner of the exercise of this universal primacy should be. This, they said, we leave for future discussions. But they made it clear that in their view, the Pope possesses a unique ministry, and that ministry is universal. Ah, oh, but the Moscow Patriarchate was not represented at Ravenna. This reason, the reason for their absence, had nothing to do with Orthodox Catholic relations. It was due to a disagreement about who should represent the Autonomous Church of Estonia. But Moscow now states 
that it rejects the Ravenna Statement. And this, to me, is a great disappointment. In, on the 26th of December 2013, the Synodical Theological Commission of the Moscow Patriarchate put out a statement on the position of the Moscow Patriarchate on the problem of primacy in the universal church. And this, I'm afraid, is much less positive than the statement of Ravenna. The Moscow Patriarchal Commission stresses there that the Bishop of Rome possesses only a primacy of honor based, they say, on canonical tradition. And this primacy of honor is not, they say, of divine origin. It was instituted, I quote their words, not by God, but by men. They go on to reject the doctrine of especially divinely originated power of the Bishop of Rome, extending to the whole universal church. The Church of Rome, they say, is one of the autocephalous local churches with no right to extend her jurisdiction to the territory of other local churches. So they deny that the Pope has a universal ministry. Then they go on to point out that the Roman Catholic view of unity is Eucharistic communion with Rome, whereas the Orthodox view is Eucharistic unity of all the local churches with one another. So Ravenna in 2007 opened a door of hope, but Moscow in 2014 has apparently closed this door. I might recall here the words of Shakespeare, in a Midsummer Night's Dream. I, me, for aught that ever I could read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. That, I'm afraid, applies to the churches. But, here, the difference is not so much between Orthodoxy and Rome, but within the Orthodox Church, between Moscow and Constantinople. Some people would say, let them argue this out among themselves, and then come back to the Roman Catholic Orthodox dialogue with an agreed view. I think it would be rather more helpful if the Orthodox were obliged to argue their case in the presence of the Catholics. <laughs> then, another possible disappointment. In 2014, the Pope and Patriarch met. This was on the 50th anniversary of the historic meeting between Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athena Gordas on the 5th of January 1964 in Jerusalem. And that was the first time that Pope and Patriarch had met face to face since the Council of Ferrara, Florence in 1438 to 39. And I may remind you that on that occasion, 1438, the Pope uh, demanded that the ecumenical patriarch should kneel and kiss his foot. I'm glad to say the emperor refused to allow his patriarch to do any such thing. So, 1964, five centuries of separation and silence were ended at last. As Patriarch Bartholomew has said last year, 
Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras exchanged fear with love. Fear with love. And this, they say, this he says, was a heroic initiative. And surely fear has often led to difficulties between divided Christians. Now, there was a sequel to that 1964 meeting. On the 7th of December, 1965, at simultaneous ceremonies in Rome and Constantinople, the 1054 anathemas were withdrawn. This did not in itself restore visible Eucharistic communion, but it was nonetheless a symbolic gesture of wide-ranging importance. And there was a further more distant consequence of the 1964 meeting. In 1980, there was inaugurated the International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox Churches. Now, on the 50th anniversary of the 1964 meeting, on the 24th to 26th of May 2014, Pope Francis and Pope Bartholomew met in Jerusalem. Has this so far had any sequel comparable in significance to the withdrawal of the anathemas? I fear it hasn't. Yes, there have been some consequences. On the 8th of June, 2014, the Pope invited Patriarch Bartholomew, President Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine, President Shimon Peres of Israel, to meet in the Vatican, my home, as the Pope called it. And they planted a tree together. I hope that tree will grow, but we haven't yet seen fruit from it. Another significant initiative has been Francis and Bartholomew have agreed to prepare for a joint celebration of the First Ecumenical Council, the Council of Nicaea, in the year 2025. A third encouraging sign is that the Orthodox have been involved in the preparation of Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, which we are eagerly awaiting and is to be issued in a day or two's time. The, in particular, the greatest living Orthodox theologian, Metropolitan John Zizioulas of Pergamum, was involved in preparing this document and so also was Deacon John Christoph Gies, who is a specialist advisor of the Ecumenical Patriarchate on environmental issues. Now, these consequences are doubtless less spectacular than the withdrawal of the anathemas in 1965, yet they are nonetheless encouraging. Is there some other initiative that is going to surprise us in the immediate future. I am watching eagerly. I would like to note in conclusion an important truth underlined by Francis and Bartholomew at their Jerusalem encounter. They rejected a minimalist approach to Christian <coughs> unity. The theological dialogue, they said, does not seek a theological lowest common denominator on which to reach a compromise, but is rather about deepening one's grasp of the whole truth that Christ has given to his church. In other words, we are to seek to agree on a maximum, not a minimum to unite in the full and total richness of our two traditions. Is that difficult? Yes, it is. But the Holy Spirit demands 
nothing less. Thank you. For, for a wonderful and challenging presentation. Um, I believe according to the plan, we're now going to go out.